Our scripture is Titus chapter 3, and we'll read verses 1 through 7. Titus chapter 3, and verses 1 through 7. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of works of righteous, not work, because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Around 1980, I was a teenager at the time, so this would have been in 79 or 80, my family took a vacation along with the family of an old Air Force buddy of my father. Dad had been in the Air Force in the 50s and had not seen this man since. And now we were going to get together two families to take a vacation. And this was a man that Dad had been um, a counterpart with. They were equals in, when they were in the military together, but clearly... Dad, at this point, looked up to him as somebody that was, wow, I get to be this guy's friend. It was kind of that relationship. The man had achieved advanced degrees in the hard sciences, and he had a successful career in business. And so this was somebody that Dad clearly looked up to as someone that he was thrilled to be able to know, which was kind of a good thing because... Dad spent a lot more money on this vacation than he normally would have because he wanted to impress his friend. So nonetheless, um, I was getting to meet this man for the first time. And one evening we sat down uh, toward the end of the day and Dad said to his friend, my son's in high school, what advice would you have for him? And I thought, oh no, here it comes. So anyway, didn't have any idea what to expect. But he asked a few questions, and we talked back and forth and so forth. And then I don't know what I was really expecting, but what he said to me was not at all what I did expect. He said, you're in high school. Take a typing class. This brilliant man with advanced degrees, a physicist, successful in business, his advice to me was to take a typing class. And then he elaborated. He said, and remember this is 79 or 80. Uh, some of us remember those days. A few of us do not. But he said to me, now, right now, somebody, he said, in my position has somebody that sits outside my door. I handwrite stuff. I take it to her and she types it. The day is going to come when everybody in roles like mine is going to have a computer of some sort on their desk, and I'm going to be expected to type my own stuff. You'll save yourself hours and hours and hours if you learn to type. That was his advice to me. So years later, I was in a workplace. I walked by a woman sitting in a cubicle. I noticed that she was hunting and pecking. And um, I said, oh, so you never learned to type. And she said, no, I didn't. I told her the story that I just told you. And when I finished the story, she scowled at me. I mean, she was, we were friends, but she was almost visibly angry. And she said, when I was in school about the same time, I was smart, 
I was a feminist, and I wasn't going to be any man's secretary. I was told to learn to type, and I refused. <laughs> and so she didn't know. It turns out that uh, my dad's friend gets the win on that piece of advice. And so simple advice can sometimes be profoundly important. I mean, I may have been expecting something about, you know, the right kind of courses to take and where to go to school and what majors would be for this kind of career and so forth. I might have been expecting that. And yet the advice, learn how to type, indeed has turned out to be something that has saved me hours and hours and hours of time. I'm grateful that he gave it. And even while I may have been a little disappointed at the time, I'm glad that I followed what he um, said to me. Now, the text that we've read today regarding our duties to outsiders is actually pretty simple stuff. It's interesting that Paul begins the passage by saying, remind them, not instruct, teach, command, remind. This is stuff that you already know. These requirements we had, these commands that we have with regard to how we are to treat outsiders, none of this is anything new. I mean, it, uh, nobody has to stand in a pulpit and display advanced learning in order to say, don't be quarrelsome and envious. This is basic stuff. And yet the reminders are there because while it is simple to understand, it's hard to do. These are things that are simple to understand. We can all teach them to our children even. I mean, some of this that we're reading is sandbox stuff, isn't it? Playground stuff. We teach these to our small children. This is the way we get along with others. These are how we are to live. And yet we get to the very ending date our lives and we still recognize that we've not mastered them. We're still growing. We still find ourselves violating these things that are very simple and yet profoundly important to our relationships. And so I want to preach this morning on something that's simple and yet very hard to do. And I do this to encourage you that yeah, these are things that are difficult to do. They are simple to understand. But the fact that they are difficult to do doesn't mean that we can ignore them. This is the word of God. These are reminders as to how we are to live our lives. So first of all, notice with me in verses 1 and 2, our duties towards society. In verses 1 and 2, remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid, quarrels, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show per perfect courtesy toward all people. Now, we can get tripped up by the opening phrase, which speaks of our attitude toward rulers and authorities, our attitude toward the government. And so certainly that's an aspect of what Paul is teaching here. But we shouldn't regard it as the sum total as of what he's talking about. He actually includes this subsection by speaking of our courtesy toward all people. And so these are attitudes that, yes, have a specific application toward those that govern us. But they also have a broad application to all of our relationships with folks that are outside the church. And so whether we are talking about uh, those that... Um, have government responsibilities, or whether we are talking about our colleagues that we work with, whether we are talking about um, those that, um, that we go to school with, whether we are talking about those that serve us in restaurants, um, and so forth. All of the kinds of business and personal and family relationships that we have can be thought of as being governed by these kinds of commands. We are not to be quarrelsome. We are to be perfectly courteous to all people. We are to be gentle in our attitudes. We are to be ready for every good work. These are attitudes and approaches that govern our relationships with all kinds of people. Now, 
it's interesting that we, we recognize this when it's not specific. The hard, the hard part is doing it um, at times when um, we rub elbows with people that we are concerned that are going to take advantage of us in some way. And, and by the way, depending on our particular personalities and approach to life, approaches to life, our particular, whether we are aggressive or, or the opposite of that, whether we're extroverts or introverts, we will struggle with these in different ways, and yet we will all struggle with them. And so if you're the sort of person that's very competitive, that's not ever going to let anybody get the better of you, then you'll have one sort of struggle with these things. If you're the sort of person that um, doesn't worry about the competitiveness, but you're fearful that you're going to be taken advantage of at some point, you'll struggle with it in a different way. And so we have different personalities and approaches to life, but none of us are immune to struggling um, with these kinds of sins. A while back, there was a meme that I, I used to see on social media that said, and it's, it's good advice, but listen to this. It said, treat the janitor and the CEO with the same kind of respect. And I read that and I thought, boy, that's really convicting. I need to start treating the CEO better. <laughs> which may not have been what they really had in mind, but if you think about it, the janitor cleans up my trash, the CEO leaves it on my desk. And so it's, it's a very different way of thinking about life. But nonetheless, with regard to all the kinds of people that we encounter, we are to um, have these kinds of respect um, and in the way um, that we treat them. Um, I think all of you know that when I come in for the weekend, I spend Saturday night in a hotel here. And back during the week that Lynette and I were down for several days, for the first time I met the manager of, uh, of the hotel, the one that had worked out a good deal for us and uh, for the church, I mean. And so in speaking with her, I said, well, I, I understand that, that you've really been good for the church to work with. Thank you for that. And her response was, uh, well, the church has been great to work with. And then she paused and she said, I can't say that about everybody. Now, isn't there a value there in the way that, um, and it happened to have been Dan that was working with them, but in the way that the church, that individuals in the church treat somebody, that I don't know if she will ever visit here or not. Um, I've only met her a couple of times now. Um, I see the same guy works every Saturday night. I invite him to come to church. But I've noticed him working. On Saturday evenings, he's very busy. He's the only one in the whole place, pretty good-sized hotel. And um, he's busy. And I've watched other people complain about, um, you know, why weren't you at the desk when I need you? Why did you make me wait? Now, all of us know that coming out of the pandemic, a lot of businesses are understaffed, restaurants and stuff. And so you know, I've tried to make it a point of saying thank you that you're here. I see that you work really hard and, and so forth. Don't know if he'll ever come to church either. He, um, he works all night on Saturday night, which makes it hard for him. But he's been invited and he um, is treated well by folks that represent the church. And so... I don't say all of that, certainly not to praise myself and not to praise Dan, but to say that the way that we relate to outsiders makes a difference to our Christian witness. And so it creates an opportunity where we can uh, share Christ um, with others when we treat them uh, well. Now, this doesn't mean that we can't express displeasure. When I go to a restaurant, I like to be served efficiently just like you do. And so... Um, there are times when we um, have to express displeasure or when um, we say to somebody, I'm going to take my business elsewhere because you're not providing a good quality service. And so these things are necessary at time, but they can, times, but we can be they can be communicated in a way that um, doesn't escalate things unnecessarily and that is not over the top. Can this make a difference, even with hardened unbelievers? 
in the Sunday school lesson that Mark taught earlier. He talked about somebody coming to faith that nobody would have ever expected to come to faith. Saul of Tarsus, the Apostle Paul, the fiercest enemy of Christianity. And some Christians were fearful of him, and yet, um, and yet there was the opportunity to minister to somebody that people thought would never become a believer. We see the same things happening in our day um, and in the last century. Uh, many Christians nowadays love to read the works of C.S. Lewis. And you've either read his fictional works or you've read uh, nonfiction like Mere Christianity and the, and the screw tape letters and so forth. Um, you know what Lewis was before he became a Christian, right? He was an atheist uh, that came to faith in Christ. Some of us may be familiar with World Magazine. That uh, the, um, I don't remember his exact title, something along the lines of editor-in-chief is Marvin Olasky. Um, World Magazine is an effort at training and utilizing journalists writing from a Christian perspective. Olasky, before, becoming, before coming to faith in Christ during his college years, was an atheist. Um, some of you are familiar with the journalist Malcolm Mug Muggeridge, who also, before coming to faith in Christ, was an atheist. Some of you are familiar with the writings of Alistair McGrath, a British professor at Oxford, who during his college years was an atheist. Uh, these are folks that have come to faith in Christ, and unexpectedly so, but they are reminders that when we deal with outsiders, that we deal with folks that may someday be responsive um, to the gospel. And so Paul tells us, be obedient, be ready for every good work, speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, show perfect courtesy toward all people, and so forth. And I've avoided the whole thing about submitting to rulers and th authorities. It's the one piece of the passage that's somewhat difficult and one that I don't want to spend a lot of time on, so I'm going to more or less ignore it, other than to say that it's one of the difficulties is that they lived under the Roman Empire. We live under um, a democratic republic, which means that submission to government doesn't mean the same thing. Um, if we don't like what our government is doing, we can vote the bum out, so to speak. And so... Um, we have different kinds of mechanisms that they did not have under the emperor. But I'll make a couple of points here and then move on to better things. One is, Paul did not say submit to the government only when you like them. Do you know who the emperor was when Paul wrote this? Nero. The one that fiddled while Rome burned. The one that two years later would be emperor when... Paul was executed. And so it was not be submissive and obedient only when we like them, but even with regard to Nero, there is this requirement. The other thing that can be said is that if we truly wish to be effective as Christian citizens, we will take this seriously. And I, I don't like to mingle my two lives, but in this instance, I'm going to briefly, and I'll say this. I, in my current job that I'm prayerfully going to be leaving pretty soon, um, one of my tasks is to train medical doctors on how to be effective advocates with their state legislators. And so I, I apologize, but I do this for a living. And so... Some of the advice I give, actually giving it in a non-Christian context, but it could come straight out of Titus chapter 3. Two of the things I say to them is if you want to be effective, number one, don't just call your state legislator when you're mad about something. If you think he's done something good, um, call him and let him know or send him an email, let him know. Don't, um, don't just be uh, the person that's... Um, griping all the time. Let them know when you think that they're doing something good. The other piece of advice that I give 
is be careful about social media. If you want to have influence on, the, um, on your legislator and you get on the, the, uh, on the internet and you say on your blog, I can't believe how this bum voted. And then you try to have the phone call where you say to the bum, I want you to vote my way this time. He's probably not going to be too impressed with what you say to them. And so respectful, not being quarrelsome, not and being um, obedient in a way that's appropriate for a democracy. Um, these are things that we um, can put into practice. And yes, they can be effective um, in our day. And so I need to move on. We've talked about our duties towards society. But second, notice with me the depravity of our souls. Look at verses, um, verse 3. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others, and hating one another. And so Paul says here that we should treat others in respectful ways, in courteous ways, because this explains what we're like, what Christ has saved us from. And we should recognize our own, our own sinfulness, our own proclivity toward getting it wrong, the things that we needed to be saved from in order to make sure that we treat others in the way they ought to be treated. And so this is the description that he gives of those that were in the church, once foolish, disobedient, led astray, um, slaves to various passions and pleasures and so forth. This is the description that he gives of us. Let me ask a question. Do you have a hard time seeing yourself this way or is it easy to see yourself this way? Apart from the grace of God, this is me. One of the, ver one of the very best analysis, analyses of this kind of thought um, came from Alexander Solzhenitsyn. Is that a name many, many of you know, any of you know? Solzhenitsyn was a prisoner under the Stalin regime. And so he knew Soviet prisons firsthand. And his most famous nonfiction book is The Gulag Archipelago, in which he describes the Soviet prison system. And early in volume one of the Gulag, he writes at length, page after page after tens of pages at length about the various kinds of torture that they put prisoners through in the Soviet Gulags. It's, you just don't read it on an empty stomach. There's one of the forms of torture that now, even now, years later, whenever I think about it, it sends a shudder up my spine. It's truly awful. And so after spending pages and pages talking about this, Solzhenitsyn says, what were these blue caps that were doing this? What kind of men were they? They had the same Russian blood flowing through their, their veins that I have. What, what made them different than me? And then Solzhenitsyn asks the hard question. If my life had different circumstances, if I were in a different position would I do, would I have done what they're doing? And then he goes about answering it. And he describes, after he was arrested, he describes a forced march that he and 10 other prisoners went on. And Solzhenitsyn um, says that uh, he had been arrested, that he had a large suitcase that he was bringing along on this forced march, except when they started to march, he said to the person in charge, I have his back. And the person in charge sort of looked at him like, so? And Sultan said, I'm an officer, and officers doesn't carry his own bag. That guy's a German, make him carry it. And so even as a prisoner, Solzhenitsyn had this arrogance, this pride. And as they marched through the city, um, actually the other prisoners started feeling sorry for the German. And so they started ex exchanging his load. And so all of the other prisoners at times carried Solzhenitsyn's suitcase. 
And Solzhenitsyn said that as we marched through a city, that we would have people gathering along the sidewalks that would, that would howl at us, they would scream at us, they would call us traitors. And he said, while they were doing that, I could smugly say that, well, they just don't understand what I understand. I get Stalin. I know he's evil. They haven't figured it out. And so he was very happy that he was arrested because he was a political prisoner of Stalin. And yet Solzhenitsyn says, while I was so proud of myself for what I knew, another man was carrying my suitcase. And they were all struggling in the hot sun. Yeah, they, even in Russia, they sometimes have hot suns. They were struggling under the hot sun and the weight for mile after mile. They carried my bag because I was so arrogant and proud. And Solzhenitsyn closes the passage by saying, if you think this is a political book, then put it away now. He said, the line that divides good from evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who is willing to cut out a piece of his own heart? Why do we treat others well? Because we recognize our own depravity. We understand what it is that God has saved us from. That he has saved us from ourselves. And therefore, we recognize that we ought to be generous, that we ought to be courteous uh, toward others as well. And so we've seen the, uh, our debt, our, uh, our uh, duties toward society and our depravity of our souls. But finally, I would have you notice with me our debt to our Savior. Look at verses 4 through 7. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through, Christ Je uh, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Now, it's very likely here that Paul is making use of a creed that they recited in the early church. Sometimes folks ask, well, where's, why do um, our churches recite creeds? Well, we have an example of them doing it in the early days of the New Testament. They had this creed and the, they were likely familiar with it. And so Paul uses it uh, to make his point, given that the, the references to pouring out the spirit and the washing of regeneration seem to have parallels with baptism, it's possible that this was even a creed that was used as part of a baptismal service. And so they might have used it in that way. But nonetheless, notice here that Paul draws a sharp contrast between um, he said in verse 5, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. There's a sharp, sharp contrast here. Works, um, our uh, works done by us or according to his mercy. Well, works done by us is not going to prevail because he's already told us in the preceding verses what we are like by nature. And so we owe our, enti our entire salvation, we owe our entire hope to God's um, own mercy. The work of the Holy Spirit, applying the work of Christ in dying and rising for our behalf. Everything that we owe, uh, that we have, we owe to Him. Everything that we have is due to Him. Notice that in this passage, He doesn't even make reference to us receiving these things by faith and by pointing that out, I'm not saying that faith is unimportant. Faith is certainly important. But Paul wants to emphasize here that everything that we have is because of God our Savior. Everything that we have is because of Christ our Savior. Everything that we have is because of what God has done in Christ that has been applied to us by the Holy Spirit. And so recognizing who we are, what God has done, should then compel us to treat others in a different way. And so he creates the entire motivation behind what we are being reminded um, to do. This is hard teaching. We can think of all kinds of reasons in particular situations. Well, I just can't do that. I just can't do it. 
So it's hard when people rub elbows with us and rub us the wrong way. Uh, we might prefer to quarrel. Forgiveness is easy, except when we have somebody we need to forgive. Uh, not being envious is easy, except when we have somebody that has something that we wish that we had. And so it goes against our personal grains. It even goes against the grain of the culture in which we live. A culture that encourages us to, we want others to treat us with respect. But we sometimes admire people that have in-your-face attitudes. And so this is a reminder that the in-your-face attitude is something that we might ought to reconsider. We live in a culture that's very quickly balkanizing, a term that comes from the Balkan mountains in Eastern Europe, where you have all these subgroups, all these ethnic groups of people that historically for hundreds and hundreds of years could not get along with each other. And so they've spent history uh, wiping each other out uh, the Serbs and the Czechs and other groups that are in that region. They've spent time wearing, wiping each other out. We see that happening in our culture. The question comes as believers, do we contribute to that? Or do we seek to turn down the temperature so that we can point people to Christ?